Well, in this video, we're diving into Revelation chapters two and three. Uh, it's an incredible section. It really is the application in many ways of the whole of the book of Revelation. The sermon I preached from this section, I called a letter from Jesus. Now, I called it a letter from Jesus, even though there are seven letters to seven churches. But as we saw in chapter one, the number seven represents wholeness, completeness. So this is a letter from Jesus to the whole church. And we'll see hints of that as we go through the individual churches to see that this is actually meant for all the churches. But as always, I encourage you just to take some time to, to read this passage yourself. It is a big section and it's good for you just to read it through, get a feel for the repetition. There's lots of repetition here. Um, lots of imagery that's worth just reflecting on a bit. Spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand his word. And there are very important truths in these chapters for us as the church to think carefully about. And as always, I'm just going to show some of the repetition just to get a feel for the structure of these letters. Uh, the first thing that we see repeated at the beginning of every letter it says to the angel of the church. So seven letters from Jesus, all addressed to the angel of the church. We saw in chapter one that this glorified picture of Jesus, he had seven stars in his hands. And we were told in 1 verse 20 that the stars are the angels of the churches. Angel uh, simply means messenger. Um, and we see in God's word, both Old Testament and New, that um, messenger, this angelos word, can be either a heavenly being or a human being. And there is debate around that, whether this is uh, the angel, as in the, the messenger to the church in a human form, the pastor of that church, or some other human messenger to the church, or is it a heavenly being um, who comes with God's truth to God's church. And there's lots of debate around that. And you can give that uh, some thought. It seems like consistently through Revelation, these angels are heavenly beings, but as I said, there is uh, lots of discussion and debate around that. Either way, they are messengers, whether human beings or heavenly beings, bringing a message to God's church. And that's the thing that's important to see, and they are very important messages. Another repeated phrase in all of the letters, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then in some ways, some of the most important repetition we see here is to the one who is victorious. So Jesus is writing a letter to his churches because he wants uh, his church to make it to the glorious end, victorious. And in order to do that, they need to keep listening to Jesus. Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the tool that's worth looking out for in letters like this is looking for the imperatives, so the verbs that are commands, and there are a number of imperatives throughout these letters that's just worth taking note of. So lots of commands throughout and some are commands to encourage them to keep going. Some are commands to repent. A few of them, uh, the NIV here loses a word that shows that it's a command. There should be the word behold. Um, they behold, that's the command, I'm coming soon. Behold, here I am. Now another repetition that we see throughout these letters is this Repetition of I know. Um, it's a, both a wonderful thing and in some ways a terrifying thing when Jesus comes and says, I know. Um, that can both be a good thing or a, a terrifying thing. And we see this type of repetition a couple of times as well. I know your deeds. So Jesus is coming to these churches and saying he knows. 
Now, just another uh, repetition or another structural thing that is worth noting. Um, the, the first and the last churches are grouped together. The second and the sixth churches are linked together. And then these central three churches are all linked together. And what we see in these central churches was uh, they were buckling to the pressure to tolerate or embrace error. What we see to the churches um, two and six, they were both facing severe persecution. The problem we see in churches one and church seven is that they had, uh, they were losing their, their love for Jesus. So we'll see in verse uh, church uh, two and six, Jesus doesn't have anything negative to say about them, but uh, to all the other churches, he has negative things. He says, yet I hold this against you. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Okay, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. To the church in Sardis, he has a whole lot. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. And to the church in Laodicea, Jesus has nothing good to say. He just has a very harsh warning to them. Um, and it's a very severe final letter. And it's important for us to see that they were about to to lose everything, about to get spat out of or vomited out of Jesus' mouth. Uh, this is a much stronger word. I'm about to vomit you up. So what we see in a number of churches is Jesus uh, commends some of the churches. Uh, he says, so you, you guys here in Ephesus, you are working hard. Uh, you're persevering. You don't tolerate wickedness. Um, you found, so you're testing people, you, you persevered hardships. So he has a lot of good commendation for uh, this church in Ephesus. Uh, they were zealous, and Jesus is saying, I commend your zeal uh, to this church in Smyrna. He says, I know your afflictions, yet you are rich. Uh, they were really struggling at what he calls here uh, the synagogue of Satan. And we see uh, that repetition. Uh, to both of these persecuted churches, uh, the synagogue of Satan, and again here. So they were facing great persecution, but Jesus says, look, I know, and you're actually rich. And they were uh, rich in, uh, in faith. They were spiritually rich, even though they were uh, physically poor. And Jesus commends them for their, their richness even in the face of the severe persecution um, that they were facing. Jesus commends the church in Pergamum. They've remained true, even in difficult days when one of their brothers was put to death in their city, again where Satan lives. Uh, the church in Thyatira are doing well, and they're now doing more than they did at first. They're actually making progress. So they are, are doing well. Jesus has very little good to say to Sardis. He says here, yeah, yet you have a few people who have not soiled your clothes. Um, so there were a few who were doing well, but in general, Sardis weren't doing well. They weren't doing as badly as Laodicea, but they weren't doing great. Um, this church in Philadelphia, again, a persecuted church. Uh, he says, I know you have little strength, but you've kept my word. You've not denied my name. He really has great words of commendation for this church. And Jesus has nothing good to say to the church in Laodicea. So it's worth just seeing the things that Jesus commends. Uh, these are things that make these churches, because what we saw in chapter one is the churches were pictured as lampstands with Jesus among his churches. And lampstands by their very nature are meant to shine. We as the church are meant to shine into the darkness. And these things that Jesus commends are things that make the church shine. Uh, they are, are working hard, they're enduring, they keeping trusting in Jesus. They're very good things. But then Jesus also comes to a number of the churches with these negative 
uh, comments. So here, yet, even though you are zealous and doing so well, yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. That is a devastating indictment on this church. And Jesus says, consider how far you've fallen. And he calls them a command here, repent. He says, if you don't repent, if you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand. Uh, that is uh, a terrifying thing. I will come and remove your lampstand. So Jesus is saying, if you don't repent, if you don't turn back to me as the, your first love, you'll no longer be the lampstand. You won't be shining the, the gospel light. I will come and remove your lampstand. See, Ephesus, if you go and read in the Gospels, they were at the forefront of world evangelization. They loved Jesus so much that they wanted the world to know about him. But they'd forsaken their love for Jesus. As a result, they had forsaken this work that Jesus had called them to do. And Jesus saying, repent, turn back, do the things you did at first. And if you don't, you'll stop being a church at all. So a very terrifying picture. Then to this church, uh, these who were suffering, they were doing well, they were remaining true to Jesus. But he says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. And then he speaks about um, Balaam and Balak. Uh, you can go and read up about them. The whole story of um, Balaam starts in Numbers 22. But you can go and look particularly at uh, Numbers 25, verse 1 and 2, and Numbers 31 verse 16, where we see uh, Balaam taught uh, the Amalekites how to entice the Israelites into sexual immorality and idolatry. And he, he's saying to the church in Pergamum, you have people like Balaam who are you, wanting you to tolerate sin, and you shouldn't tolerate having them in your church. So he says, I have this against you. And again, he calls this church to repent. To command, repent, turn away from that. Otherwise, I'll soon come to you and I will fight against you. So again, a terrifying thing. I will come to you and will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. That's a picture of judgment. So they aren't small warnings that Jesus is giving here. Now to this church, you are, are doing more than they did at first, the church in Thyatira. Again, there's this idea of tolerating the woman Jezebel. Uh, you can go and read up all about her in 1 Kings. Um, her story is in 1 Kings uh, 16 verse 31 or 1 Kings uh, 21 verse 25 to 26. You can go and read up about Jezebel. She was an evil Israelite queen who again led God's people astray, and he's saying to the church in Thyatira, you have somebody like her right in your midst who is teaching you to, to be sexually immoral and idolatrous. And he's saying, I gave her time to repent, but she's unwilling to repent. She won't turn away. And then he's saying to the church, well, unless they repent of her ways, they're going to be in big trouble. I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I'm here, search his minds. So again, a terrifying um, proclamation that the Lord Jesus makes against this church if they don't repent. And then to the church in Sardis, um, he says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. So just having a good reputation with the outside world of being a church is on fire, not necessarily a good thing. Jesus says you're actually dead. Wake up. It's a, a command. They are sleeping. It says, remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold fast to it and repent. Again, this call to turn back to Jesus. Another command there. Hold fast to Jesus. And if they don't wake up, Jesus will come like a thief. And they won't be ready. Jesus wants these churches to be ready. To keep going. So he, he gives these commands against them. Uh, the most terrifying one comes here. 
to the church in Laodicea, there's nothing good that Jesus says to them. Uh, Laodicea itself geographically had very poor water. Uh, it wasn't uh, hot or cold. It, was, it made people sick. And Jesus is saying to them, you're just like the water that you drink. Uh, you, you nauseate me. And if you don't change, I'm going to vomit you up. Uh, they say they're rich. They, they think they've got it all. But Jesus says, you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And Jesus is saying, stop trying to find uh, in all the things around you, in, in your riches or uh, in the way you dress. Uh, don't try and find your significance in those things. Don't lose your love for Jesus. Don't be lukewarm. But he says something very important here in verse 19. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So it's in love that Jesus is saying all of these things. Yet I hold this against you. Nevertheless, you have a reputation. Wake up. Don't be lukewarm. Because I love you, I'm telling you these things. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and eat with you. And so throughout these letters, Jesus is urging his church to be among those who are victorious. And another important repetition to see is that every single one of these letters ends with a glorious glimpse of the future that awaits. And what all of these give us a picture of is the glorious future that awaits. You'll be able to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. You won't be hurt by the second death because you'll be, have life as your victor's crown. This uh, hidden manner, you'll be fed by God like his people in the wilderness. And uh, a white stone, white we'll see throughout the book of Revelation is this picture of, of purity with a new name, God's name written on you. You'll have authority over the nations. This picture of um, Psalm 2, which we'll see picked up later again in Revelation, uh, will be ruling alongside King Jesus. And he says, I'll also give that one the morning star. And what we'll see when we get to the end of Revelation, uh, in, in Revelation 22, Jesus calls himself the morning star. So Jesus is saying he will give himself to his people. Their names will never be blotted out of his book. He'll make them a pillar, firm in, in his presence, in his temple. And he will write on them a new name, his own name. And then gloriously, I will give them the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious. That's important to see. See, we can only be victorious because Jesus was victorious. Only because of him can we be counted among those who are victorious. He sat down and we will one day get to sit down with him if we are victorious, if we listen, if we hear what he says to us. And so John is giving us the application of the whole of Revelation. It's a letter from Jesus. It's full of commendations to the church, things that they're doing well that will make them shine for Jesus. It's got a number of important warnings to not be a church that tolerate error, uh, don't be a church that lose your first love. You want to keep loving Jesus until that day when you will be with him for all eternity. And wonderfully, Jesus encourages his church and he says, whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen to me so that you will be victorious and you'll make it to the end. And he says here, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The victor's crown is coming for all of those who listen to Jesus and keep living for Jesus until that day when he returns. We need to listen to the warnings of this passage and think seriously about where we may be in danger of not shining as churches. And we need to pray that we would listen to Jesus and live for him until that day when we are with him as victorious ones because of the victory that he's won for us. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches.